Tilapia farming in sub-Saharan Africa. Tilapia is an amazing fish. The Nile tilapia is one of the most farmed fish in the world. I think it's currently the fourth most farmed fish. And if you have a look at the chart, you can see in the year 2000, 1.1 million tons of tilapia was produced. By 2018, 5.9 million tons of tilapia was produced globally. You can also see the average price um, went from around one US dollar 40 per kilo down to a low of a little bit more than one US dollar per kilo and it's back up at about one US dollar 40 per kilo as a global average. If we have a look at the situation in Africa, in 2000, 172,000 tons were produced. By 2018, 1.3 million tons was produced. The whole fish price in Africa varies considerably depending on which country you're in. On the cheap end of the spectrum, tilapia sells for about two US dollars per kilo. And on the more expensive end, it's around five US dollars per kilo, with the average being somewhere in the region of three US dollars per kilo. We said a month ago that in 2018, approximately six million tons of Nile tilapia was farmed. And we may as well speak about Nile tilapia and tilapia is the same thing because Nile tilapia is more than 99% of total production, either Nile tilapia or other species that have been hybridized with Nile tilapia. So if we consider for a moment that 6 million tons was produced in 2018, for me, I can't quite grasp what a pile of 6 million tons of tilapia looks like. So for illustration, let's assume the average mass is 300 grams. That means that 20 billion individual fish were produced in 2018. That is a massive number. If furthermore, we assume that each fish is three centimeters wide and we put them side by side, all facing in the same direction, we would have a line of tilapia 600,000 kilometers long. Ladies and gentlemen, we are talking about a phenomenally big industry. When we have a look at the production in Africa, we can see that Egypt produces more than three quarters of the total production of tilapia in Africa. And in fact, Egypt alone represents 81% of the total. The other two major producers are Ghana and Uganda. The rest of the continent produces about 8% of the total. Nigeria and Zambia being the only other significant players. As an aquaculture species, tilapia offers many advantages over other species. First of all, it's extremely hardy. Hardy in terms of its water quality tolerance, as well as its disease tolerance. They don't really have terribly many issues with either. Also, they are a vegetarian species. Thus, we can feed them feeds that are based on plant material, which is a lot less expensive to produce than an animal or fish based diet. The reproduction is simple, almost problematically so. And this is part of the reason why they have been so popular with small scale aquaculturists, because virtually anyone with a male and a female fish can suddenly become a, a fish breeder. Tilapia also have a mild flavor with very few bones, which can be completely excluded from the fillet during processing. And they've got a firm white flesh, making them a natural replacement for the marine whitefish species, which are no longer available as they were previously. Because of all these advantages, tilapia has become known as the aquatic chicken. In terms of the disadvantages, Oreochromus niloticus, as mentioned, is more than 99% of the global production of tilapia. Yet it is that species is still unavailable in many parts of Africa for environmental reasons. The concern being that they're not present in those countries and if they escape into the wild, they could establish a population. Another disadvantage of tilapia is their precocial spawning. What we mean by this is that if you have males and females together in a tank or in a pond, then what happens is, is the males start breeding as soon as they and the females are sexually mature. The males make nests, they attract the females, they court the females, the females lay eggs, they mouth brood, and everyone's focusing on reproduction and no one's focusing on growth. So you end up with a pond or a tank which is overstocked 
with small stunted fish and that is a mess. We get around this by managing them for a single sex population. We'll chat about that a bit later. Other disadvantages in Africa relate to the limited access to quality fingerlings. And if you want to farm commercially, you really need access to quality fingerlings. There is also a lack of technical skills across the continent, such that large commercial operations are generally well run and they have access to the technical skills. But the smaller scale operators run very rudimentary operations, generally because they don't have the technical skills to farm the fish commercially. There is also a limitation on the availability of quality feeds in Africa. The feeds are available, but they are very expensive. Then in terms of the strains of tilapia, we get a red form, which is hybridized with Mozambicus at some point, I believe. But we get a red form, which is popular in the formal markets, but it's less popular in the rural markets. You also get various other strains. Uh, gift and genomar and so forth uh, and then also we get the yy genetically male tilapia where we have all male offspring so we don't have the problem of mass breeding when we're actually trying to grow the fish and these yy genetically male fish do grow very well but unfortunately the technology is too expensive to be commonly available for most people in terms of the living environment, tilapia are temperature sensitive. They are tropical species and as a consequence they grow optimally at a temperature of 28 to 30 degrees Celsius. There is zero growth below 20 degrees Celsius. So although they will survive down to, depending on the species, 10 degrees, 12 degrees, 13 degrees thereabouts, effectively because there is no growth below 20 degrees, and because growth is half by 24 degrees, we need to really make sure that we farm them at the optimal temperature for the species in order to get commercial growth rates. And that is 28 to 30 degrees Celsius. The chart below shows the water temperature from Lake Volta in Ghana. And you can see that is an ideal environment for farming tilapia. Over the course of the year to be monitored, the water never went below 27 and a half degrees. It never went above 30,5 degrees perfect for farming tilapia. In terms of pH, tilapia are also tolerant of a very wide range, but we generally farm them in the range of 7 to 8. This chart shows how temperature sensitive tilapia are, and you can see that at a temperature of 26 degrees, this strain, and courtesy to Til Aqua for the use of this graph, this strain of tilapia takes 224 days to grow to 500 grams. However, if you increase the temperature to 29 degrees Celsius, they get to the same weight in a mere 160 days. That saves you 84 days out of the growth period, roughly 30% of the growth period. That amounts to a considerable saving, and it shows you why it's so important to farm the fish at the right temperature. In terms of metabolites, we mentioned already that tilapia are very robust and they can tolerate ammonia and nitrite levels of around one milligram per litre without problems. In terms of dissolved oxygen, they should never be exposed to dissolved oxygen levels lower than five milligrams per litre. That is regarded as a comfortable minimum. They will survive lower than that, but again, we're not trying to keep them alive. We're trying to get them to grow optimally. They don't perform well, neither can they convert their food efficiently at a dissolved oxygen level of less than 5 milligrams per litre. Light intensity and photoperiod are also fairly important. Um, optimal spawning is achieved at a light of 18 hours and dark of 6 hours per day. In terms of salinity, Nile tilapia should not be exposed to salinities above about 8 parts per thousand. Whereas Mozambique tilapia, the optimal appears to be about 25 parts per thousand. And we get optimal growth and cold tolerance at that temperature. But spawning is compromised. Reproduction of tilapia. There you can see a photograph showing a nest of a tilapia. And in fact, at about two o'clock in the photograph, inside the nest, you can see a large black male. That is an exceptionally large nest. Most tilapia only nest in about a 30 or 40 centimeter diameter nest. 
The two photos on the right show a female tilapia at the top and a male tilapia at the bottom. You can see the female has got a wide round genital opening. The male has got like a little papillae, like a little tube with a tiny hole on the end. Bearing in mind that the male needs to release sperm, which are microscopic, as opposed to the female that needs to release an egg, which is a couple of millimeters in diameter, you can understand the need for the different sized holes, and that's a good way of remembering who's who. Tilapia have this precocial tendency, and therefore we farm them in single sex populations. Males grow significantly faster than females, and therefore we use all male populations. You can obtain those all male populations by sorting. In other words, you turn the young fish over, look at the vent and estimate whether you believe it's a male or a female. This is not accurate. It's very time consuming and it means that half of your population, which are females, get discarded. So that's not an efficient way of doing it. You can also hybridize, which is fantastic from a research perspective, but not practical on a commercial farm. And you can also use YY broodstock, as mentioned, which will give you all male offspring. However, that is an expensive technology, which is not yet widely available, purely due to cost. By far the most commonly used technology is to use methyl testosterone mixed into the food at about 60 parts per million for the first two weeks of feeding. This turns the population into all males. When I say all males, I mean 98, 99% males. And the occasional female is so outnumbered by the males that spawning is no longer an issue. And that is a very inexpensive, low tech way of doing it. And that's how we obtain single sex populations for tilapia farming. If you're farming tilapia in tanks, we have about 10 fish per square meter with a ratio of three to four females for every one male. The optimal temperature for spawning is in the range of 25 to 30 degrees Celsius. If you're spawning them in ponds, you'll typically have about two fish per square meter, but once again, three or four females for every male. Females produce about 300 eggs per spawning, and that very much depends on the size of the females. What you'll find is the smaller females will produce two or 300 eggs per spawning and they'll spawn about once a month or so on, in, on, in a commercial setting. However, your large females can produce up to 2,000 eggs per spawning, but will commonly only spawn every second or third month. So most farmers prefer to use smaller females. It also enables you to get through the generations faster enabling you to bring in new genetic material and selected advantages. The female mouth broods the eggs. So there are two ways in which we can collect the eggs. The first option, which I do not recommend, but it's a very simple option and therefore it's commonly used, is to simply go through the broodstock tank or the broodstock pond once a week or so, pull a fine mesh net through the pond or tank and remove the fry and return the breeders to continue breeding. This is a very rudimentary, in fact, it's a lazy way of doing it. It's not very efficient at all. A far better way to do it is every seven days to harvest the eggs from the females. Those eggs are then placed in an incubator and incubated until they hatch. To improve this yet further, what we do is we run the tanks or the ponds in pairs. Only one of the tanks in the pair has got males in it, the other one does not. Each week when the females are checked for their eggs, the males are moved out of the tank or the pond where the females are breeding into the pond or tank that doesn't have females in it. Next week, we harvest the tank once again that had the males in, return the males to the opposite tank or pond and harvest the eggs from the females. This gives the females a week of rest and a week of breeding, a week of rest and a week of breeding. And they perform far better when managed like that than when they're left with the males permanently. Water quality and stress affect fecundity so we need to make sure that we have really good conditions for our fish in order to have successful spawning. Egg survival to hatching should be around 80% and egg survival to sale should be at least 60%. Egg survival to sale can easily be as high as 80% in tilapia. 
There you can see some homemade cooling bottle incubators, which work absolutely fine. The important thing with the tilapia eggs is that they need to be kept moving all the time. So the water enters from the top, goes down the black pipe, inside the blue pipe, and, and enters the cooling bottle right at the bottom, in the neck of the cooling bottle. So it creates a high velocity there, lifting and stirring the eggs, which are heavy. So they lift and stir, and then they tend to sink, and then they lift and stir and tend to sink. The water rises and overflows through the outlet at the top. Here you can see a different type of incubator where the water enters at the bottom of the incubator at an angle, creating a circular movement around the bottom of the incubator which keeps the eggs all moving. These incubators are great because they are less sensitive to water flow. With traditional incubators, if the water flow is too fast, you wash the eggs out. If it's slightly too slow, they all settle on the bottom and the line between the two is quite fine. With these incubators you don't have such a fine line and the eggs tend to move more evenly and more reliably. On hatching we stock the fish in tanks at 10 fish per litre for the first 10 weeks. With good water quality and oxygen you can double that stocking density during that time but I don't propose you start there. For the first two weeks, even 18 days, we feed the fish food which includes methyl testosterone at 60 parts per million. There is some controversy around the use of, of hormones. There is plenty of research that's been done on the levels of methyl testosterone in market-sized fish, comparing those from natural populations versus those from populations that were fed methyl testosterone at fry. And there's no difference between the controls and the treated fish right down to the nanogram level. So let's just say that there's no difference between treated fish and untreated fish in terms of the hormone level at market size. Sorting and thinning of tilapia is extremely important and you can see on the right hand side if you're going to go for the lazy man's way of just having your males and females in the pond once a week harvesting the fry you're going to catch all sorts of different fr sized fry and that is in fact a very rudimentary size sorter it's a plastic container, we've cut slits in the bottom with an angle grinder and the newly hatched fry fall through the gaps whereas the larger fish remain above. So it's a quick and simple and low impact way of separating your fry from the fingerlings. And it's important to separate them because the fingerlings will eat the fry if you don't separate them. In terms of intensive fry rearing, there you can see a glass tank with an absolute blur of small tilapia fry in it. Fry rearing, on hatching we place them in cages for four weeks. For the first two weeks we feed them methyl testosterone. At four weeks we move them to fingling cages for another four weeks. The reason for the move is that we reduce the density by a factor of 2.5. Then for the second four week period they remain in those cages again and then at eight weeks of age we harvest them and we either stock them into ponds or we stock them into cages. Rearing them in ponds, where the climate is suitable, ponds work extremely well for farming tilapia. There you can see a typical pond of three quarters of a hectare or 7,500 square meters in area, but maximum depth is only about one meter. Most of the pond is about 70 centimeters, as we discussed in the earth ponds chapter. If you're farming the fish extensively, that is without aeration, you can stock up to a maximum of about three fish per square meter. For intensive farming, in other words with aeration, you can go up to about six fish per square meter. But bear in mind altitude does affect this. And the higher your altitude, the less oxygen in the water and you may find that you need to reduce your stocking density yet further. Dissolved oxygen, feeding, water quality and so forth are all very important to successful growth in earth ponds. Cages work really well for tilapia where the climate is suitable and by climate we mean water as per that chart we looked at for Lake Volta a moment ago. So where your water is warm enough throughout the year, cages work very well for farming tilapia. And in cages we can go up to densities of about 50 kilos per cube. 
Below you'll see two slides. The slide on the left is your traditional cage as is used across much of Africa. That is Lake Volta and that's your typical 6 by 6 meter cage which will have about 2 tons of fish in it, very roughly speaking, at the time of harvest. On the right hand side are much smaller cages. These are low volume, high density cages. And when placed in a situation where there is a constant slow current through the cages, you can go up to densities of as high as 80 or in some instances even 100 kilograms of fish per cubic meter of water. But each cage is obviously very small. Recirculating systems are very suitable for farming tilapia as well. And again, on aeration, we can go up to densities of about 50 kilograms per cubic meter, depending on your altitude. Typically, the intensive fry reading cycle starts with breeding tanks in which the adults are held. Every seven days or so, the females are stripped of their eggs and the males are moved to the adjacent tank in the pair. The eggs are then incubated, a process that takes another three days or so and a further three days until the fry have completely absorbed their yolk sac and are free swimming. At that point they are moved to fry tanks. For the first two weeks they are fed feed which includes the methyl testosterone to turn them all into males and then they typically remain in those tanks for a further two weeks or so until they're about four weeks of age. At that point they're then harvested, size sorted, the density is reduced and they're restocked into fingerling tanks for a further four weeks. At the end of that period, they're once again harvested, size sorted, the smallest fish are culled and the remainder of the fish are divided into larger tanks for grow out to market size. There's often one further size sort and reduction of density prior to them being harvested and sold. Feed for tilapia is vegetable based. Fish meal is, is usually included, but it's, it's primarily there for palatability and for the addition of certain amino acids not as freely available in a vegetable-based feed. Food conversion for tilapia should be at least 1 as to 1.3. In other words, we need 1.3 kilos of feed for each kilo of growth. We feed tilapia small amounts often. The fry are fed about 15% of their body mass per day. And by the time they get to market size, they're only eating about 1% to 1.5% of their body mass per day. Fry require about 40% protein in their diet, and adults need about 25 to 32% protein. Marketing tilapia is commonly done via informal markets across the continent. This photograph shows a scene of a whole lot of hawkers who have arrived to purchase fish from a fish farm in Zambia. The farmers harvest the tilapia, they place them on the bank and when they believe they have enough they are divided up between the ladies and they pay a certain amount per fish and off they go. Bear in mind if you are considering value adding that whatever the whole fish price is for the tilapia, that is obviously 100% of the price. As soon as you gut and gill a tilapia you lose about 10 or 11% of the weight. If you remove the head you lose around 50%. And if you fill it to tilapia, depending on the strain and the age of the fish, you're only left with between 25 and 33% of the fish. So if we were going to get $1 for the whole fish, we need to get somewhere between $3 and $4 for the fillet in order to be making the same amount of money off our fish. So be very careful of value adding with tilapia because they don't have a particularly good dress out percentage. China is by far the biggest producer of tilapia in the world. In 2014, they produced 1.5 million tons at a value of about 4.4 billion US dollars. I've often wondered what percentage of tilapia produced in China are exported as opposed to for local consumption. And what we found was that in 2014, of the 1.5 million tons produced, 926,000 tons was exported which represents about 60% of their production being exported, which means that about 40% of their production, it can be assumed, is for local consumption, which is huge. Tilapia is sold in every form you can imagine. Fillets, skinned fillets, smoked, whole, frozen. Bottom right, you can even see tilapia sold for sashimi. 
That is a typical way in which tilapia is sold in Africa. That's about a 220 gram fish served whole on a very normal sized plate. That photograph shows you some value added top end supermarket type product. 40 South African Rand for 185 grams. Obviously this is firstly fillets and secondly it is very much value added. So it's straight to the end user. But that equates to about 216 rands per kilo. There you can see a beautiful looking tilapia. It's got a small head, nice deep body, and it appears to have a nice wide body. That's the sort of fish you would want to use as a breeder. Tilapia skin has become very famous in the last few years for its medicinal use in treating burn victims. But you can also see the leather made from tilapia is suitable for other purposes as well. I trust that you have found this video to be useful. If you have, please subscribe and feel free to have a look at our website, aquaafrica.co.za, if you need additional information. Alternatively, feel free to email me and I can assist you. All the best and happy tilapia farming.